I'm Al O'Quinn, the senior pastor here at Bethany Baptist Church. I want to thank you for joining us on our television broadcast today. It's not by chance or accident that you've joined us today. I pray that as you tune in, you will recognize and realize God had you join us today because he has a message just for you. And so I hope that you'll listen intently and you'll be obedient to the prompting of the Holy Spirit as the Lord speaks to your heart today. I want you to know that we want to pray for you and pray for your needs. And so you can call us at 770-957-4455 and leave your prayer request. Answer machine will come on and you'll leave your request. If no one can answer the phone, please leave it on the voicemail. And we will pray for you. We'll return your call if you leave us a number. And be assured that we'll pray, praying for you and all of your needs. So thank you for joining in the broadcast today from Bethany Baptist Church. I hope you'll come and see us real soon. God bless you, and we'll go to the service right now. We're glad to have Dr. John Duncan with us this morning from uh, Georgia Baptist Convention. Let's give Dr. Duncan a round of applause. He is in charge of uh, music in our convention and works with uh, uh, worship pastors in our state, the Sons of Jubal, and uh, he does a lot of wonderful stuff. So we're glad he's here. He'll meet with our search team, worship pastor search team this afternoon. So we're delighted that he's here. Thank you so much, Dr. Duncan, for being with us today. I want to ask uh, Mike and Dreamer McCoy, if they would, to come up to the platform this morning. Uh, Mike and Dreamer have been at Bethany since 1999. And uh, Mike uh, served in men's ministry. And Dreamer worked with uh, children, and she's teaching kids again, children again in Sunday school. And Barry is going nuts because she's leaving. And uh, I wanted them to share a word with us about uh, what's going on. They're going to Duchesne, Utah uh, to, to work at First Baptist Church. Mike's going to be the pastor there. So I've got, uh, I got the mic on. I just want you to share a word with us, would you? Thank you, Brother Al. Um, Brother Al has started a series on one another, how we are to pray for one another yep. and confess our sins to one another and to uh, share with others the needs that we have. And so let me begin with confession. Dream and I are in the process of packing and moving to move to Duchesne. And we need to confess that we're hoarders. <laughs> It is awful. The more stuff we give away and throw away, the more it just seems to multiply. And it just, it's, it's uncanny how this stuff, uh, you just can't get rid of it. But uh, having that out of the way, I do want to ask you for two things this morning. They've been outlined in the bulletin that uh, Brother Al has on the, on the front there. And, and by the way, you did, a, you did an awesome job on that. I appreciate that, all the good words. Uh, two things that we, we need. One of them is really easy. And that's the money part. It is really easy to reach in your pocket and make a donation for the work of the Lord. The other one is a little harder. Um, the other one is I'm going to ask you to pray for us while we are there as we begin this work, especially in the, in the very beginning. And pray for us as we make this transition um, to a place that is unfamiliar. It's a, it's a huge culture shock. I don't know how many of you have ever been out there, but it's, it's just a different lifestyle. It's a different place. It's a very dark place spiritually. And we're struggling in this move. It's hard to leave. Uh, someone said parting is sweet sorrow. The closer we get to departing, the sweeter it gets, but the sorrow is here now. And I was sitting there this morning thinking about this church and the 16 years. This is brothered by my pastor. And now I'm not going to have a pastor. Yeah. But as he talked about in his message last week, prayer knows no boundaries. The geographical difference between where we are today and where we'll be um, means no difference to God. And I want to ask you to, to pray for us as we leave our family, you folks, and our, uh, our, our kids and our grandkids and so forth. Pray for us for strength. And then the really hard part. As you know that 
Utah is um, a dark place spiritually that the Mormons control everything out there and that Christians are in the acute minority. Um, but Paul says we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities and powers and authorities in the, in the darkness, in the spiritual realms is where the battle takes place. And I want to share something with you very specific. I want you to pray very specifically for me and for Dreama and for our church. When Joseph Smith was approached by an angel of light and told to start a new religion, this angel that appeared to him identified himself as Moroni. He is the principality or the prince, if you will, much like in Daniel chapter 10 where the angel Gabriel said, I would have been here three weeks ago, but I had to wrestle with the prince of Persia. Same principle. The prince of Persia is still there doing his work, which is very evident in the news today. The prince of Utah or the prince of Mormonism is there. and His name is Moroni. He identified himself. And I don't know what strategic advantage that gives us, but I remember in Jude, as, as Gabriel was um, contending with the devil over the body of Moses, even Gabriel would not rebuke Satan. And he said, the Lord rebuke you, Satan. So in your prayers, if you would just utter those words as you remember us and you think about the spiritual battle that we're going to be in, just say, the Lord rebuke you, Moroni. The Lord rebuke you, Moroni. And pray that God would protect us and pray for, for the light to shine into the darkness. You know, I have a mental picture that God gave me. Y'all all saw the, the news of um, Katrina when it came on shore in, in Louisiana. And, and how that big, huge, from the air, that big, huge cloud had this little eye right in the middle, the little hole. I, I picture Utah as a cloud of darkness, and right over the city of Duchesne, there's a hole where the light of the glory of God is about to shine down. Amen. Amen. Pray for that, if you Amen. would. Amen. We covet your prayers. We thank you for your fellowship, for all that God has done Amen. in us and through us in this church. And, and how much all of you mean to us, and we're, we're going to miss you terribly. But we have to go where God has called us. Amen. Thank you. Amen. God bless you. <laughs> Love you, brother. Love you, Dream. Thank you so much. And we'll be praying for them. And, uh, and on the 22nd of February, uh, we're going to have a commissioning service for Mike and Dreamer and commission them uh, to service to Utah. But until then... We encourage you to pray for them, and we encourage you to give, that the Lord would uh, bless and help in that work and help them uh, to get moved to their new place of service. So please do that uh, if you would. I want you to look uh, this morning in uh, the book of John, the Gospel of John, chapter 13. And you're familiar with the passage of Scripture. We have started our series, uh, the One Another series, the directives of Scripture in the New Testament, to love one another, to edify one another, to encourage one another, to forgive one another. And today we want to talk about love one another. Last week we talked about pray for one another. Today we talk about love one another. You're very familiar with the text. It's found in John's Gospel and uh, the 13th chapter. And uh, we'll read from that passage of Scripture, verse 34. A new commandment I give you. That you love one another, just as I have loved you, you also are to love one another. By this, all people will know that you are my disciples if you love one another. And then the epistle of John, 1 John, if you would. 1 John chapter 3, one verse, verse 11. For this is the message that you have heard from the beginning that we should love one another. Verse 12, actually. We should not be like Cain, who was an evil one and murdered his brother. And why did he murder him? Because his own deeds were evil and his brother's righteous. Let's pray together. Father, thank you for this day, the day that you created, a day when we get to come together and joyfully come together as a people of God, this local body of baptized believers called Bethany. We come to worship you today, Lord. And we give you all honor and praise. And we pray, Lord, as we render you the calves of our lips, that you would be blessed in our praise and our worship. And now, Lord, we look to your word for encouragement, for strength, for wisdom. 
And Father, we pray that as we read, as we hear, as we listen, that we'd hear your voice. We pray the Holy Spirit would be our teacher and to teach us and give us understanding and illumination. I pray, Lord, that you'd shield me behind the cross, that I lose myself in you. I pray, Lord, that uh, you might be exalted. Thank you, Lord, for this privilege. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Love one another. What does love mean? Well, a, a, a group got together and began to question some uh, preschool children and uh, kindergarten children, maybe some first graders about love. What does love mean? What is love? How do you see love? How do you recognize love? And uh, they started writing down what they thought or telling their mama so mama could write down what they thought. And these were a few things they came up with. This is love. When my grandmother got arthritis, she could not bend over and paint her toenails anymore. So my grandfather does it for her all the time. <laughs> Even when his hands got arthritis too. That's love. That's right. That's love. Another one said, love is when a girl puts on perfume and a boy puts on shaving cologne and they go and smell each other. That's love. Love is what makes you, I like this one. Love is what makes you smile when you're tired. Love is what makes you smile when you're tired. Another one said, love is when mama sees daddy all smelly and sweaty and still says he is the handsomer than Brad Pitt or Bradley Cooper. That's how children see it. What's love look like? How do you see love? How do you understand love? How do you interpret love? Uh, Jesus said, a new commandment that I give to you, that you love one another. And they knew about love. But the Lord Jesus came to flesh it out in front of us and show it what it was like and to show us how to do it. And he takes love to a new dimension and a new level. And then he challenges us. As I have loved you, so you are to love one another. And in the epistle of John, we have an example of one that we are given in the scripture. Don't do this. Don't be this way. This is not love. And that is a picture of Cain. He said, this is the message you've heard from the beginning, that you're to love. Don't be like Cain, who rose up and killed his brother. That is not love. Don't be like Cain. Don't be like Cain, who was prejudiced and full of jealousy and anger and hatred and malice. For out of Cain's life would flow the attributes of that to which he was connected, the evil one. Now, what spurred on his Anger. Well, Abel rendered unto God an offering that was pleasing to God. Cain did not. God accepted Abel's offering, did not accept Cain's offering. Cain got jealous of the righteousness of his own brother and rose up and slew him and killed him. It provoked great jealousy in the heart of Cain to such a degree that it went from anger to murder. So Cain is not a picture of love. Because in his heart there was anger, and from anger there's murder. And it flows out of the connection with the evil one. But Jesus is our model. Jesus is the model for love. In Cain's inner nature, it brought forth all that was in him, and he fleshed it out. Anger, wrath, murder. But our example is Jesus Christ. And I want you to notice when you read the Scripture, you understand something. The Scripture says as it talks about love... It gives us a real key about what Christianity is about and who we are and how we're to look and how we're to walk and talk. And it should be that of love. The scripture says this. Now listen very carefully. We know. Did you hear that? We know. There's no doubt. There's no questioning. There's no trying to figure it out. We know. Gnosko. We know that we have passed from death to life. We know. We have passed from death to life because we love the brethren. We love one another. Now get this. We know we've passed from death. 
There was a time in my life and your life when we were estranged from God, Ephesians chapter 2. We were at enmity with God. We were hostile toward God. We had no need of God. We had no desire of God. We were at enmity with God. We were in death, damned and doomed for devil's hell. But in the conversion experience, being born again from above by the convicting power of the Holy Spirit, we have passed from death, enmity with God, to life, life in Christ Jesus. And because we have passed from death to life, the Spirit of God is in us and we're able to love. We have the Spirit of God in us. Now, what, what would be the fruit of the Spirit? The fruit of the Spirit is the first one. What is it, church? Love. The fruit of the Spirit is love and joy and peace and gentleness and kindness and meekness. And so out of our life as believers should flow this thing called love. And we watch Jesus' example. How did he love us? Well, we see his love as he stretched out on Calvary's cross. Calvary does cover it all. He laid down his life. And there's no greater picture or image of love or demonstration of love than the love of Jesus Christ laid out on Calvary's cross, raised between heaven and earth, dying for our sins, being the propitiation for our sins. There's no greater love than this, that one would lay down his life for another. And by the way, you know this. It was not the nails that held him to the cross. It's the cords of love that bound tighter than any nail man could ever mold. His love for you and his love for me. So what does he say to us? As I have loved you, you are to love one another. Sacrificially. Sacrificially. We are to love each other. And so Jesus Christ in this new community of faith called the church that he established, it is a community of faith. And he says to the community of faith, this world that you live in will know that you are my disciples because you have 50 years of perfect attendance pen in Sunday school. Well, we don't do that anymore. No. The world will know that you are my disciples because of your love. You love each other. You care for each other. You pray for each other. You cry with one another. You edify one another. You forgive one another. You help one another. Jesus fleshed this out before the eyes of his disciples. As he would gird his loins with a towel and would wash his disciples' dirty feet. He loved them. And when you love someone as Jesus loves, you're willing to serve that person. And Jesus served. He loved. And he died. But there's all sorts of passages, many scriptures in the New Testament that talk about the love of God. I don't have time to read all of those for you this morning. But in Matthew eleven twenty eight 28 and 30, he loves us. He demonstrates that because he cares for us. He says, listen to what he says. All of you that are troubled and burdened and heavy laden, come unto me. And I'll give you rest. Take my yoke upon you. It's easy. It's light. And you'll find rest unto your soul. No one ever cared for me like Jesus. He demonstrates his love by his care. He demonstrates his love for us because he forgives us as he hangs on Calvary's cross and they mock and they, they ridicule him and, and um, curse him. There he hangs between heaven and earth. And what does he utter? utter? What do they hear? They've never seen anybody die just like this. Most of those they hang on a cross or find themselves on a cross, they would be cursing and swearing, but they've not seen anybody die like this. Listen, what was that he said? What did he say? Father, forgive them. They don't know what they're doing. He forgives us. 
He says, if you will confess your sins, I'm faithful and just to forgive you of all your sins and to cleanse you from all unrighteousness. He cares for us. He forgives us. He fleshed it out. He loves us without conditions. Romans 5, 8, God demonstrated his love toward us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ Jesus died for us without conditions. And then you go to Luke's gospel, chapter 15, and you begin at the 11th verse, and you read through the 32nd verse, and there you find the account of the prodigal son. And this is Jesus letting those listening and us who would read in the scripture what God is like, what the love is like, what the father of the prodigal representing God is like. No matter that you find yourself in a pig pen in a foreign land, your father will receive you just as you are with open hands and open arms because you can't do something so horrible and so terrible that God would say, no way, no how. There are no conditions on his love. He receives us just as we are. And that old prodigal picked himself up in a pig pen, thought about the demonstration of his father as he walked with him and lived with him and said, I'll go back to my father. I'm not worthy to be a son. And there he finds the father running toward him, violating everything he'd been taught in culture as his ankles are exposed as he runs toward his son because this my son was dead and now he's alive. He was lost, now he's found. And he put a robe on his back and a ring on his finger and shoes on his feet and he rejoiced. Because his son had come home. There were no conditions there. He forgives. That's how he loves. That's the way we're supposed to love. Without conditions. Love must be tough, yes. And yes, we stand and speak the truth about sin, but we don't condemn people. We love them. It's not our place to condemn. It's not our place to judge. That's God's place. But we receive people and love people as they are. He doesn't condemn us. They brought a woman to him caught in the act of adultery and said, Moses said she should be stoned. What do you say? Stooped down and wrote something in the sand and then said, let him who is without sin cast the first stone. They dropped their stones, their rocks, and they walked away. She looked up from a fetal position trying to cover her nakedness. And he said, where are those who condemn you and criticize you? They're gone. Neither do I condemn you. Now listen to what he said. Go and sin no more. He didn't check off. He was not condoning her sin and her wickedness and her giving over to the desires of the flesh and a sinful nature. He said, go and sin no more. But there was not condemnation. And Jesus is very clear in the scripture. I did not come to condemn. It says it in John's gospel. God sent not his son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. Let us as Bethany Baptists and Southern Baptists and Georgia Baptists be known that God loves people just the way they are and we don't condemn them. God, Jesus came not to condemn, but to save. And that's how we must live life and how we must love. He doesn't condemn and then in John 14, 6, because he is love, he points the way to salvation. He says, I'm the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes to the Father except by me. You know, if we really love one another and you love someone that doesn't know God, because you're caring for their soul and caring for their eternity, you'll talk to them about Jesus. You'll try to point them the way to eternal life. That's the way we love one another. That's the way we love those who don't know God, those who are different than we are. Love, love one another. And Jesus said, love, and how has he loved us? Despite our faults, our failures, and our mistakes. And then I want you to get this in the scripture we read. Jesus, we're not to judge. Now here's the thing you get. When you and I as believers stand up and point out sin, that which comes back toward us from those, you're judging us. Don't judge us. Well, we're not judging. We're just saying, here's what the Bible says about that. But the Lord Jesus gave a marker or a measure to the world to use on us to test our authenticity and our credibility as the children of God. What is that? What is that? Jesus gives the world a measuring tool to check our credibility as his disciples. Now listen to what he says. By loving one another as I have loved you, all people will know you are my disciples. 
Now, did you get that? Jesus is saying to the world, hey, I've given the world a measuring rod to test your credibility as a follower, my follower. By loving me, he's talking to his followers. He's talking to us. By loving, by loving one another as I've loved you, all people will know you are my disciples. So in our living, in our day-to-day -day going, coming and going, in the barbershop, the beauty shop, the grocery store, wherever we would find ourselves in conversation, would the words of our mouth indicate that we know God? Would our attitude and our disposition indicate that we know God? A few years ago, a book came out, a long time ago, a book came out called Love Languages. And I use that in premarital counseling, and it's a great tool about love and how you find love and how you speak love. And, of course, we say we love each other and we need to verbalize love, but we need to speak love in the language of that person. Well, I'm not going to get into the love language, but I think in this aspect of loving one another, there are some things that come to mind. The way we love one another is by affirming one another, and that's a love language. Affirm one another. We need to affirm one another, edify, build one another up. When's the last time you affirm someone, encourage them? We need to love. To love is to do acts of kindness, acts of kindness, serving one another, helping one another, serving one another, acts of kindness. Loving one another is touch, touch. Now, I'm, I'm married uh, to an educator. My daughter's an educator. My daughter-in-law's an educator. And I got a lot of good friends in, this, friends in this church that are educators. And in this time of the year, people are concerned about flu. And so... I, you know, do we toll hands? Do we touch? You know, we're concerned about germs and flu. You see, as you go out, we got all these dispensers where you can get, get the stuff on the hands and all this stuff. Now, I will tell you, rest, rest, we'll never, ever drink out of the same communion cup. You can just relax, okay? But touch is important. There's some people here today, if they're not touched in a loving way, They'll go all week without being touched. Do you know there's something therapeutic about touch? I, I think there was a study done years ago in Germany about babies that were held and cuddled and loved on as opposed to those who did not receive as much care. And the difference, the difference in those children were astronomical as it, as it pertains to, to emotion and development and maturity. Touch is important. We need to touch each other. We need to touch each other. It's okay to hug. It's okay to touch. It's okay to shake hands. The Apostle Paul said, receive each other, greet each other with a holy kiss. They touched each other. That's the way we love. We give the touch. And it's gifts, and it's giving people the undivided attention they need in the time of crisis. And here's what happens in life as we love one another. Your life will be interrupted Whatever you're doing will be interrupted. Someone needs you. Now you have to stop what you're doing to love somebody. And sometimes we get caught up in our agenda and our purpose and what we've got going on. And it's hard for us to stop and it's inconvenient. But listen, Jesus always walked slowly through a crowd. And he was interrupted and he was stopped. And he would demonstrate love. We need to love each other. Last thing I want to share with you this morning. Uh, as I was reading and looking at this aspect of love, I read to you those little comments from the children of how they saw love. I came across an article about uh, a guy that was trying to measure love and test love and trying to get the stories of the children and, and, and teenagers about love, and adults too, I suppose. And he was compiling all this information. And from that, he would choose, the writer would choose, what he thought was the best demonstration of love. So it was a biased thing, I guess. It was based on his opinion. But it really spoke volumes to my heart. I want you to listen. He calls it the most loving child or the most visual adequate display of love the winner of this contest i suppose was a four-year-old child whose next door neighbor was an elderly gentleman who had recently lost his wife 
Upon seeing the older gentleman crying, the little boy walked into the older gentleman's yard, and then the four-year-old boy walked up on the porch to the chair where the older man sat crying. The little four-year-old boy climbed up in the gentleman's lap, and he just sat there. When the four-year-old boy's mother asked her son, what did you say to him while you were sitting there? The little boy responded, nothing. I just helped him cry. Nothing. You know what love means? It's not having to say something. It's just being there. Presence. I asked myself, I asked you, when's the last time you helped someone to cry? A new commandment I give unto you, that you love one another. Let's pray. Father in heaven, we need help loving as you love. We must confess, Lord, that so often our days and our time and our lives are focused on our own agenda, our own little world, to the neglect of those around us who need affirmation, who need a prayer, who need touch, who need somebody just to cry with them. And Lord, help us to love and help those in this community that look at us know that we are your disciples because of the demonstration of our love to one another. They not hear us talking bad about each other. They not see us being mean to one another. But every time we're seen in community, would always be a demonstration of love. Lord, what the world needs is love. And help us to flesh it out. And may you be seen in us because you're love. Thank you for loving us. Speak to our hearts today, Holy Spirit. Bring deep conviction in our hearts. And help us to love because we only can do that by your enabling power and the work of the Spirit of God in our lives. Father, if there's someone here today that doesn't know you as Lord and Savior, I pray today would be the day of salvation for them and they respond to the gospel. Or for those, Lord, that are looking for a place to call home, to plug in and use their gifts and abilities and talents for the furthering their kingdom. Should they feel prompted, Lord, may they step out to respond as you lead them today. But we commit this time of invitation to you, so very important for people to do business, your business. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, I hope you enjoyed the message today and the time of worship. And I pray that you sense the Lord's presence right there where you are in your own home or in a hotel room or wherever you're watching the service today. We hope that uh, you sense the presence of the Lord. And hope you'll be faithful to tune in every Sunday on this channel at this time to watch the broadcast. I want you to know that Bethany Baptist Church is located at the corner of Highway 81 and uh, Bethany Road. And we encourage you to come and uh, visit with us. If you have prayer concerns, please call us at uh, our church number, 770-957-4455. Or you can email us at uh, www. Uh, 4nbethany.org and uh, we'll be glad to hear from you take your prayer requests and I assure you that we will pray over your needs so thank you for joining us and look forward to uh, you being with us again next Sunday God bless you mm -hmm.